nothing was going right. Um, I had no prospects for the future. Everything I'd ever had or acquired in my entire life was gone. I just sat there crying. I just had a panic attack, and the bank was directly across the street, and I, I guess I was somewhere deep down. I felt like money was going to fix everything. It was completely illogical. One, two, three, oh. <laughs> Rock and roll used to be about danger. He was just like, give me the money, I'll blow your fucking head off. It wasn't clean, it wasn't Disney fine, you know. One of the most important things if you're playing live music is to make the show. He would make himself bleed. He once stuck a banana up his ass and threw it in the crowd. Nobody wants to go over there anymore with music. He had like fake balls, man. They fell out at one point, I had to hand them back to him at the end of the show. No one really does much crazy stuff anymore. They put a note in the, in the Wells Fargo bank to me and it's like, hey, send me money or I'm going to run into there. He's got to be really smart to be able to like think of that. He's got to be in a bad place to be that inept, to do it so poorly. He passed a note. It seems just like self-destructive. He's not a dangerous person. I'm totally, I'm totally for people robbing banks. Everyone fucking break the law. It's cool. Wow, I'll do this. Here I go. There's no way anyone's going to take this seriously, but I'm still going to get in a whole lot of trouble. What's up, dudes? Yeah. Can you see me? You guys want to hear a joke? It's terrible. It's the difference between a baggie of cocaine and a baby. Uh, yeah, the difference. Uh, the baggie of cocaine and a baby. Eric Clapton would never let a baggie of cocaine fall out of a window. I've known Richard since middle school. My brother and I were in the high school jazz band. We were the first trumpets in the WeBCs. This is in 2001 when we joined the WeBCs, along with a bunch of the rest of the jazz band. Richard's a really great artist. He's a great songwriter and also a great performer. He needs to be creating things, creating music. That's all he cares about, even in jail. I'm just so anxious to work with him, hang out with him again. We shared a bill with them, though, our funk band, South Pop Preachers. I have sung with his band a time or two, but like, screw that, it's way too loud, man. I am trying to sing for the rest of my life and like a long career, and screaming over his rock band is not the way to do that. And he knows his audience. He knows, he knows what they want. <laughs> they're, they're the things that he wants, <laughs> pretty much. But, but he knows what they want, and and he knows that, that if you're playing live music for people, it needs, needs things to happen, and he makes yeah. them happen. We haven't seen any of the stories of him like peeing on people off the stage, or Ginny was like sick and she went to go sing with them, and she was singing and she just turned around and barfed off the stage, and he like grabs her and starts like making out with her, and I wasn't there for any of these cool stories! He lives that all the time. And he loves music, and he loves people, and he loves art, so... And he loves history, oh my gosh. <laughs> he loves Texas history so much. <laughs> and so, you know, we would hang out and um, 
in the house and smell pot. Can you tell, can you see that you're in love with me? Everybody knows and it shows. Can you tell? Can we kiss and we hug. Can't you tell it's a love? Everybody knows and it shows. Can you tell? Richard's a brilliant person. He's a really smart guy. He's got really good um, ideas about how rock and roll sounds. You know, Richard is uh, part of, considers himself part of, and is fascinated with the whole punk rock movement. So I think there's part of approaching performing that way that I can relate to. Like what he does musically makes a lot of sense to me. You know, if you can just stay out of jail, get out, do something, stay, hang on to that spirit, stay on the dangerous side of things if you have to, but you know, figure out a way to turn that dangerous rock and roll spirit into something that lands you in, on the more stages than it keeps getting you in trouble. Nobody wants to go to that dark rock and roll spirit side of things and live it. And that punk rock thing, it, um, when, you, when you're there with it and you're living it and you're, you're playing a music that's accepted because people have tried to strip away all those pretensions, nobody's judging anybody in that. And Richard's follies around some of the stuff that I was around then would have been so minor. It would have been just like everybody else. I mean, everybody was doing crazy stuff. Yeah, uh, so if I was gonna like, if I got really excited and I was about that loud, that's about as loud as it would get. I can't imagine myself getting any more louder than that. Everything you ever said to me was a lie. You never wanted anything but to make me cry. But I can't help the way I am, and you can't pass the oral exam, and I ain't no idiot. Well, like, I mean, I came from, like, a broken home. My parents were divorced when I was really young, and, like, you know, then I got moved to Denton, and, like, I hated it, and a stepfather who hated me, and I hated him, and everything sucked, and, like, I just felt like I didn't really belong anywhere. So we lived on the outskirts of town, and I had this bus driver. We would just talk about music and stuff, and I remember he was like, you should check out this band, The Misfits, and I was like, who the fuck is that? And the first time I heard it, I was like, what the fuck is this? You know, and then... The second time I was like, all right, this is pretty cool. But the third time you're listening to it, you're like, I worship this, <laughs> you know? I started a band a month later. <laughs> I didn't even know how to play, but I was like, I have to have a band. Once I discovered punk rock, I was like, there's this whole other thing out there, you know? Like, you, you, you're just, you're a punk rocker. We were on tours, our first tour. I lied to my mom, told her I was going to church camp for two weeks. And when we showed up, the bartender jokingly asked are you guys the band where the singer plays naked and Matt Pohl our guitar player at the time said yes yes we are I got a large amount of shots from the bar the band started playing and I kicked open the bathroom door and ran out bare ass naked through this giant punk rock crowd and started screaming and yelling to the microphone and everybody lost their fucking shit so I just started having girls give me their panties before the show and I'd wear them on stage. It's a, both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> it's all I ever wanted to do. I haven't wanted to stop since and I haven't stopped since, except for going to prison or being in the hospital. <laughs> Hey, 
I wish my mom People to the company that can read board. It's where people who've never been in the business come to fucking, you know, get their start, you know, and unfortunately all these motherfuckers think that it's better for them to move to Austin, so they move to Austin, nobody ever hears from them again. Austin's where Din bands go to fucking die. Din is exactly like how Austin used to be back in the fucking early 80s. You know, from what I hear from the old timers, I mean, it's just a goddamn, it's just ready to blow, and... Dude, I'll put it to you this way. You can go grab you a case of beer on a fucking Friday night down at the uh, fucking uh, Midway Mart down on uh, Carroll. Walk up either Oak or Hickory Street. You're going to hear a house party. You're going to be able to knock on the door, come in. And nobody's going to know who the fuck you are, but you're going to be able to see a fucking show. And if you have beer with them, you're going to be able to sit around. Probably get all kinds of free drugs and shit. The fucking place is paradise, man. It's amazing. It's the last fucking bastion of American freedom. You can be 31 years old and ride a bicycle still get fucking laid. It's awesome. <laughs> I wish my mom would smoke pot with me. I wish my mom would smoke pot with me. Yeah. You know, when you're a performer, like, what you, you just think about the moment, you know, like making things work in the moment and. You, it's difficult thinking about like things like after the you know the future things like that. And I just assumed everything was gonna be okay. That's just what I thought, you know. The most beautiful woman on the planet is half of my baby. Like this is gonna be awesome. When I dropped her off at work, she was crying, and she was asking why I. Well, basically why I couldn't get my shit together, why I didn't have any money, and like I just had a panic attack and I cried and. This is after she'd gotten out of the car and gone inside. And... It's that goddamn bank across the street. I drove through there twice, because the first time I drove through there, I just got some deposit slips. And I wrote like a, a note on the deposit slip. Give me all of your money. I remember the teller being like, is this, is this for real? It was so weird that everybody acted all scared. In my brain, I was like, but I'm Richard. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a mean person. I don't know why you're, you know? It, it blew my mind. It totally blew my mind then. I started hearing those cop sirens coming. I got scared. I just hopped in my car and flew, like, <laughs> flew out of there, dude. I didn't know what to do. And I hadn't talked to my dad in years, years. I called him panicking, and crying, telling him exactly what had just happened. And you know, it was like the first time in a long time that I thought my dad gave a fuck about me, dude. He said, hide your car, boy, I'll be there in an hour. And I said, well, what are we gonna do, dad? And my dad stood up and he's like, boy, I'm about to go buy two cases of beer and we're gonna drink all night. Tomorrow we'll go turn you in. Maybe they'll go easy on you. You know what, I got to stay up all night with my dad, just drinking and talking and hanging out. It might sound dumb, but I'd rub that bank all fucking over again just to get that fucking time with my dad. Even all the prison, all that shit. Whole thing, I'd do it all over again just to get that fucking moment. Who would think that they would sentence him to 10 years of probation, especially if, I mean, they have no way of knowing that he is not capable of maintaining those kinds of stringent requirements. And then, ugh, ugh. It was at White Hawk. There was this like, hippie community out there, out there that's on a wildlife reserve. And I'd lived up there kind of off and on uh, with Elena, because Elena had the whole upstairs, her dad lived downstairs. And uh, I kind of just became, dare I say, part of the family. I mean, you know, it was just, I mowed the yard and stuff, and I loved it, and she raised chickens, and it was paradise. It was like kind of like the safe place that I went when things got way too heavy. He and another friend and Elena were hanging out at another friend's house, and there was drinking, maybe copious amounts of drinking, and um, I think Elena might have left to go, like, from what I understand, get more booze or something. And um, 
got hit head on on Elm, I believe, and um, just died instantly. I think everyone was drunk, and the other driver was going the wrong way down a one way very fast and hit her head on. And then Richard didn't really want to keep living there after his friend passed with just, you know, her dad. And then um, he kind of, you know, went into this crazy and wild downward spiral. I, know, I knew there was some stuff going on then, and I was uh, driving down 380 uh, one day, and I knew that Richard had been in trouble. And it was, I don't know if I was thinking about him at that moment, but I was concerned about him and <laughs> just looked over and there's this figure just walking by itself out in this field, just by itself. And I'm like, oh, that looks strange. I looked over and it was Richard and I saw where I could park and I knew he was probably in a real, not in a good place. <laughs> so I just pulled over and started walking toward him and held my hand, my arms out, you know. That was a pretty dramatic moment, going up and giving Richard a hug, basically letting him know in case he didn't that people were still in his, were behind him, and believed in him. Once he became homeless, he couldn't satisfy yeah. the, the address, like maintaining a stable address requirement. Yeah. His parole officer. He ended up living in a tough shed in someone's backyard. Yeah, he, and he was like, I'll tell you where I'm living, but it's a shed. <laughs> There's not really an address. And they were like, <laughs> he tried to draw her enough. a map and she was like, no. <laughs> From what I understand, he just like stopped going to the things and just, like, What's the point? you know. And he was preparing to, to. Cops came to her house looking for him, and went all around the whole land, like around town, looking for him at various bars where he used to hang out. Our guitar player lives above J and J's where we were playing. Five guys in Hawaiian shirts went up his stairwell, thinking that he was Richard, but then. Actual, real Richard came up the stairwell yelling for Matt. Richard! Then the guys in Hawaiian shirts realize that the real Richard had just come up the stairwell and so they arrested him instead. His idea was to play the show because, you know, and afterwards get, get arrested because they're not gonna like cause a big scene while the band's going. It is terrible. A bunch of people are like ready to play and ready to watch, and then it was announced that, oh, Richard just got arrested, we can't play. And we just kind of like sadly went home. It's weird looking back on some of that shit because like it's just, since then, a lot of these things have kind of just been like a part of my life. But now sometimes like some of these things I'm looking back, I'm like, God damn, that was fucked up. You know, like that, like, how the fuck did I even make it through that thing, you know? But I'm, I, here I am in jail now, and I feel so much better than I ever had in my whole fucking life, so it's a weird dichotomy. If I don't have a creative outlet, I go fucking insane. Most guys in here, like, they'll buy one of these little pads of paper that's got, like, 50 sheets in it. I'm well beyond 20 of them. I mean, like, I've been constantly, constantly writing. Hopefully, someday, something that I've gone through, something that I say or write, um, helps somebody else go through probably some s similar shit. And I would say that if I can help a single person through some of the shit that I've been through, that it makes all the shit that I've been through worth it, if that makes sense. It makes it to where, um, it gives it meaning. It wasn't just in vain. I'd like to think that it would, something that I, I did mattered someday somebody else. Trace the small of your back It's written in super glue way to your arsenal the angel
angel smiles back, lonely cherubim. A lot of things have happened like in the last year. So, I mean, my dad died in January, yeah. you know, and one of the last things he told me was like, you know, he was 60, and he was like, boy, I was supposed to be retiring when I was 62. And like, I had all these things I wanted to do, and all these plans, I wanted to go fucking fishing and camping with you and the grandkids, you know, he's like, but I can't do that anymore. He's like, boy, don't you wait for anything. And it was like really the first time he like, acknowledged my music career. So he's like, I know you want to do this, go after it with everything that you got. We're recording, or we're playing, or we're fucking rehearsing, or I'm, we're writing, or I'm doing an acoustic show, or like, you know what I mean? Constantly like, if there's a free second, that's what I'm doing. His whole life is like a performance art piece, you know? And he chooses to live it that way, and it seems chaotic, and but it's so, in, it is, but it's intentionally chaotic. The fact that it doesn't make sense is almost the most appealing aspect to it, in a way. That's a good time to put into practice what I'm talking about, you know? Like, just don't approach it with any judgment. Richard had an eye for, like, a percentage, at least a small percentage of people to go, yes, yes, that's so offensive. I want to see it again. A band that lasts 15 years or so can't be supported solely by him stripping down. He was talking about how he's kind of noticed himself mellow out a little bit when it comes to um, that sort of thing, because he, he's saying his body can't take it anymore. You know, like he thinks, he definitely thinks about things. He usually, he sometimes thinks about things through very thoroughly before he does them. I don't want anybody to ever forget me. I like having that microphone in my hand. I like screaming and yelling and like everybody in the room being like what the fuck this dude's insane but everybody's looking at him one two three go Goes away.